Hello, everyone. My name is Christine McCormick. I'm a child protection advisor for children and armed conflict and fragile states. It's a first webinar um, on uh, the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on addressing recruitment and use of children. Good morning and good evening and good afternoon to, to everyone. I appreciate everyone who's been able to join, particularly those in, in Asia where it's very late. I would like to thank in particular the Global Alliance on Child Protection in Humanitarian Action for their support and cooperation in holding this webinar and also the French language webinar that we have uh, on Thursday. Today we have colleagues from the Philippines, from South Sudan, from Nigeria, who will be able to share some of the experiences, some of the challenges um, that they've had in implementing programming and advocacy of children associated with armed forces and armed groups um, and how they and to highlight ways in which they've uh, tried to overcome them. We will also be having a Q&A session after the presentations, but I'd like to start our webinar by um, inviting Audrey Bollier from the Alliance to start us off. Uh, thank you very much, Audrey. Thank you, Christine. Hi, everyone. Um, as Christine mentioned, my name is Audrey Bollier. I am the co-coordinator of the Alliance for Child Protection and Humanitarian Action. I would like to, to send a warm welcome to all our speakers and attendees uh, today from all over the world. The Alliance is an interagency network of over 100 members working on setting standards and providing technical support. Since the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic, the Alliance has been responded by producing technical notes version one and two, together with 10 annexes, including one on children associated with armed force and armed groups, 26 webinars and a series of podcasts. And you can find all those resources under the Alliance website. Uh, we have a tab uh, named COVID-19. At the outset of the pandemic, child protection actors had begun to express concerns about COVID-19 could affect a particularly vulnerable group of boys and girls known as children associated with armed force and armed groups or CAFAG. CAFAG refers to any person below 18 years of age who is or has been recruited or used by an armed group or force in any capacity, including but not limited to children used as fighters, cooks, porters, messengers, spies, or for sexual purposes. We know that every day a child remains with an armed force or group, he or she is at risk of physical, psychological, or sexual violence, and even death. Programs that prevent recruitment, separate children from armed forces and groups and support the reintegration process are all life-saving interventions. In May 2020, the Alliance published a document titled Key Messages and Consideration for Programming for CAFAG during the COVID-19 pandemic. The document, which is available in English, French, Spanish, and Arabic, can be found on the Alliance website, as I mentioned earlier. This document highlights issues related to the prevention and response programs for CAFAG in light of the wide-ranging socioeconomic impacts of the COVID-19 and restrictive or at time repressive containment measures, as well as the unique dynamic of each conflict context. Over the past few months, we have been able to learn more about how COVID-19 has impacted CAFAG programming on the ground. And I'm very happy to be able to welcome our speakers today, who will be able to share with the consequences of COVID-19 on CAFAG programming in their context, what challenges they had to face, and what we as a child protection community can learn from their experience. Thank you, and I wish you a very good webinar. Thanks very much, uh, Audrey. Um, so we now have three short uh, presentations um, looking at the three countries we we mentioned. We'd like to start with Philippines and I'd like to welcome Farid Esther and Maria Makov to uh, give a, a brief overview of some of the, the challenges they've experienced their, um, and promising practice they uh, have seen and developed in their programming. 
Thank you very much. Thank you, Christine. Good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good evening. I am Farid Dastir, a child protection specialist with UNICEF in the Philippines. I'm joined by uh, my colleague, Rouhani Baragir, a child protection officer, and Mariam uh, Akub, program coordinator from uh, our implementing partner, Community and Family Services International. Today we'll present how we do the follow-up support for children uh, disengaged from uh, MILF, a Moro Islamic Liberation Front, and post-disengagement uh, reintegration during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. In this uh, presentation, we'll uh, talk about the overview of the disengagement and reintegration program, also uh, program adjustment in the context of uh, COVID-19, as well as reintegration support for uh, disengaged children and their families. To give you just a background, UN, United Nations, and MILF signed uh, UN Action Plan for disengagement of children that resulted in uh, disengagement of uh, 1,869 children back in 2016, late 2016 and 2017. And the reintegration uh, program has been going on uh, since then. Now, uh, out of those children, 730 of them are now uh, undergoing the reintegration program. The others uh, are beyond 18 years old, or now they're adults. The difference in the Philippines in this case is because the majority of these children, they live with their parents, and their parents are themselves members of the non-state uh, armed group. And there was no pattern of forced or formal recruitment or incumbent or uh, separation from parents or caregivers. In most of the cases, parents' consent uh, was present. Uh, so the children joined together with their families with the non-state armed group. In such context, uh, the disengagement means disassociation of children from the roles they perform for and in the armed group and transition from military to a civilian life. This slide shows the different roles children were playing in the armed group. So uh, you could see start from cooking and then uh, to checkpoints, combatant, uh, so many different roles uh, as explained by Audrey. This map shows the uh, geographical areas that children uh, uh, have been registered prior to the disengagement process. The green dots represent municipalities and the shaded lights Colors uh, indicate the uh, number of children in a given province. So all 1,869 uh, children, they are coming from uh, South and Philippines, from Mindanao areas. The UN MILF action plan was signed back in 2009, but there were a number of uh, setbacks, uh, although it showed the significant commitments from the MILF to end recruitment, but a number of conflicts uh, happened and there were some setbacks. But officially, finally, the uh, MILF, uh, UN MILF Action Plan officially started in 2014 when the uh, benchmarks of the UN Action Plan was endorsed by the MILF leadership. And finally, with the completion of the all benchmarks, uh, 1,869 uh, children uh, released or uh, dis uh, disengaged from MILF in, in uh, late 2016, early 27, 16, 27. The whole process uh, for implementation of the uh, UNML action plan, as well as the lessons learned have been documented. And uh, it's also one of the successful uh, implementation success stories highlighted in the fifth country report uh, produced by the uh, Secretary General uh, on the Philippines, and it's available uh, on uh, UNICEF Philippines uh, website. You can share a link later on to the chat box also for the colleagues who are interested to learn more. And with support from UNICEF, the reintegration program uh, has been going on since October 2017, contributed to prevention and reassociation of these children back to the armed groups and armed forces. So these are the backgrounds that uh, I shared. So may I call uh, upon my colleague, Maryam from uh, CFSI to share the program adjustments in the context of uh, COVID. Thank you. Over to you, Maryam, please. 
Yes, Farid, thank you so much. Good evening, uh, good afternoon, and good morning, everyone. Uh, yes, Farid, uh, that's true. Um, on the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, we want these adolescents and youth and the children to continue um, in their participation on the reintegration process. So um, what are the adjustments we were made during this uh, COVID-19 pandemic? First is that the life skills and the psychosocial support session was uh, conducted in a weekly basis, modular and guided sessions at home, plus session on COVID-19 uh, prevention. And in order for them to be uh, aware also on information and perception on the impact of COVID-19 um, to their daily lives and their coping mechanism, we also let them to join new report. And then um, we maintained our communication uh, with them through uh, mobile phones, group chat, using social media accounts and provisions of top up um, mobile loads. And then also we were able to linkage them in other C CSO partners through uh, radio programming on child rights and online uh, youth engagement activities and also advocacy with other youth networks. Also, we were able to mobilize our Muslim religious leaders uh, for them to deliver sermons and key messages on protection and prevention of risk of reassociation in communities. Follow up support also, like home visits, in order to continue um, for some uh, families without access to internet. But of course, serving social distancing, wearing face masks and face shields. And for those families without mobile phones, we were able to uh, mobilize also, or we were able to depend on our parasocial workers to reach them through neighbor or um, immediate family members from the community. And for those children who have their access to inter internet or connectivity, mode of communication with them is through social media platforms, phone calls, and SMS. And then ways of uh, reaching these children and their families um, are through a rented motorcycle and boats for home visits. Uh, of course, observing proper health protocols. And then um, coordination also and referrals to other partners was done in order to cope up on the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. On the reintegration support for the children, at this point of time, uh, we were able to refer at least these 1,869 disengaged children to Ministry of Social Services and Development and Ministry of Basic and Higher Technical Education for possible assistance. And out of uh, these um, 1,869 uh, disengaged children, 186 of them is orphaned, which is also referred to Ministry of Social Welfare and Development for uh, welfare assistance from 2020 to 2021. And then 621 of them in school already referred to uh, MBHTE for scholarship and uh, school supplies support to continue their education, especially in tertiary level. And then um, followed by another 162 families out of the 1,561 families already um, under validation of the MSSD for their Sagip Kabuhayan program. Another support from the government are those families from Central Mindanao. A total of 117 received uh, vegetable seeds from MAFAR and a family also in Mandulan Tawi-Tawi received a livelihood assistance of fishing net and accessories. Uh, all of these are uh, this 2020 and in support to them during this COVID-19 pandemic. A total of 878 families also from Lanao, uh, knowing that Lanao and Marawi City is one of the hotspot uh, area uh, of COVID-19 in, in, in Mindanao. Programs and organization were able also to give them uh, livelihood support, lamination uh, machine, uh, including uh, printer and welding machine. No? Um, those pictures are among those livelihood 
support given to the families in Lanao. And I think uh, that's all for our presentation from the Philippines. Thank you and more power to everyone. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Miriam. Uh, over to you, Christine. Uh, thank you. Thanks very much, Miriam and, and Fareed, uh, for that. Um, I'd now like to invite Richard Tulakwa and Vanessa Sarova, um, who are our colleagues from South Stan. Thank you. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. So my name is Vanessa Sariva. I'm the Senior Protection and Gender Advisor with uh, World Vision in South Sudan, although currently calling you remotely from home. We'll take you through a few slides and discuss the situation in South Sudan, and then I'll hand over to my colleague Richard from Save the Children to introduce himself and, and continue on with the presentation. So I'll start generally with the context in South Sudan, and feel free to read this at your leisure. Um, but what I really wanted to highlight with this slide is the situation in South Sudan, particularly around the, the political dynamics, um, highlighting that it was only in February of this year that the coalition government was finally formed uh, following years of delays in the ongoing civil conflict beginning in 2013. Um, now, this is a highlight, but it also scores how um, rampant the use of armed conflict and particularly children in armed conflict has been throughout the course um, of the civil conflict in South Sudan. Since 2018, um, there's been over 3,000 children that have been released from armed forces. Um, or sorry, since the beginning of the conflict, there's been over 3,000 children that have been released. It's been in 2019 uh, that 1,000 were released, but all of this to say that the number is um, generally at 19,000, and so this needs to speed up and we need to be doing this quicker, safely, and effectively. Uh, the first case of COVID-19 was in April 2020, um, and that has continued to rise since then which has um, also created an anti-UN and anti-NGO sentiment in the country. This has affected the overall peace and security dynamics in country, which was also highlighted in the Security General's report in June of 2020. So all of this to say that there are relevant structures for demobilization, release, family tracing, rehabilitation and reintegration that is ongoing um, with strong coordination among partners. In terms of the continuity of services, since COVID-19 reached South Sudan in April, um, there's been significant release of uh, children that was originally planned that has been halted due to various restrictions. Um, we know this, and I know that I'm certainly preaching to the choir, so to speak, in this forum, um, but child protection related activities are not seen as life-saving, so we did have to halt operations significantly. Um, between January and June, thankfully, there were 97 boys and two girls that were released. But all of that to say the Joint Verification Committee that's established has also experienced delays and isn't able to conduct timely activities. Family tracing and reunification work, this has also been paralyzed um, for both uh, children formerly associated with armed groups as well as unaccompanied and separated children just to highlight how um, real and, and dangerous, frankly, the situation is, is that um, immediately prior to the outbreak, any children that were released, they somehow got stuck in, in Juba and were unable to travel and be reunited with caregivers because of the various travel restrictions in country, curfews, and also a halt on certain services uh, deemed by the government at the time. Continuity of care has also been affected. Uh, so caseworker training, mentorship, this was done remotely. Having worked with caseworkers, they are honestly the pride of, of our program and not being able to conduct trainings in person really has affected the quality uh, of overall care that we're then providing to children. Much the case around the world, certainly in South Sudan, schools were closed, including a vocational training. And with children formerly associated with armed groups, the vocational training and life skills is particularly important. It offers them uh, different options for those who may no longer be interested in school or far too many years have passed and they're looking for alternatives. So both of these options were removed from them. 
And then of course, we're continuing on with one-to-one -one case management where we do have uh, PPE available. And then overall disruptions on children and families. This is a socioeconomic crisis uh, still in South Sudan. Interim care centers or families have little to no money um, or income or additional resources. So we are hearing of additional asks from both the centers and the families that we're working with. The, the push-pull of children involved in armed groups and armed conflict were concerns that a situation like this where there are restrictions, households aren't able to provide for their families, even more so, uh, that girls or bo and boys may be um, or feel forced to return to these armed groups um, and seek negative coping activities or mechanisms. Just overall, I've mentioned the impact on vocational training, um, and then, of course, with limitations in travel, the ability to follow up, provide direct case management support or one-to-one -one support in households among peers with communities, et cetera. This has also had an impact um, on case management as well as mental health and psychosocial support. So I'll pause there and hand over to my colleague, Richard. Richard, over to you. Thank you so much, Vanessa. My name is Richard Talagwa. I work with Save the Children in South Sudan country program as child protection technical specialist. COVID has impacted, of course, resource mobilization in country. UNICEF appeal for 2020 CAFAG implementation was 43 million US dollars and the 89% of this appeal is underfunded. And of course, since UNICEF funds many local NGOs as well as international and child protection NGOs within South Sudan. It means that uh, uh, the funding for many uh, local NGOs as well as the INGOs was affected because UNICEF was not able to realize most of the funds it, I mean, um, it, it, it had hoped to raise under its appeal. So you find that many CAFAG programs for some of the local NGOs as well as of INGOs had to close and meaning the services uh, that they were providing to uh, children associated with armed forces and armed groups were affected. Donor governments have diverted pre uh, uh, previously allocated funding to their own national COVID response or international efforts. Since COVID has affected, I mean, uh, uh, all countries of the world, you find that uh, many uh, donor governments that had pledged to support pro CAFA programs in South Sudan um, had to uh, withhold the funding, uh, suspended, so that they are able to address issues of COVID within their own countries. And this have, has affected funding for um, both UN agencies, uh, INGOs, as well as uh, local organizations within South Sudan, and it has directly impacted our services to, to, to children associated with armed forces and armed groups. Some organizations have had to end programming and they had budgets reduced, resulting into handover of committed this uh, had handing over of their caseload, CAFA uh, caseload to uh, community based organizations without any reasonable sustainability plans. In terms of adaptations, how we, we have been able to adapt, um, NGOs are taking increased uh, leadership in CAFA coordination, mitigating reduced funding. Uh, on UNICEF and partners, particularly for children remaining in interim care. Uh, for instance, um, prior to the COVID outbreak in South Sudan, uh, we had uh, 32 children released from, um, from armed forces around the, the capital Juba, and these children were put in interim center. But because yeah, diff, uh, organizations were um, experiencing shortage of funding, a coordination meeting was convened where, of course, partners were asked to raise resources to be able to support those children. Those children, are current, some of them are under, uh, in institutional care, others are in committed based uh, interim care, and the organizations are pulling resources to be able to support them. Virtual trainings are being held uh, compared to um, with varying degrees of success. Of course, the best um, in our context would have been face to face but because of the challenge of COVID, we are now conducting virtual trainings to ensure that uh, uh, services for CAFAG and other vulnerable children are able to continue. Our case management continues while observing COVID-19 SOPs. Of course, there's been COVID restrictions have affected 
uh, case management services with the restrictions on, on movement of uh, case workers. But all the same, we continue in many locations, we continue to provide case management while observing COVID-19 SOPs. So that was uh, the presentation from South Sudan. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Richard and, uh, and Vanessa. Um, our third presentation is on Nigeria. And I'd like to invite Patrick Kwame, Irene Mwangi, and Christian to present. Thank you. So good day all. With me is um, Irene and Chris, and we will try to be brief and present the situation in Nigeria, specifically on center and community-based uh, reintegration. Uh, what best practices we've come across, what are the challenges and some of the lessons learned. Um, our outline will look specifically uh, on the reintegration, um, both center and uh, community-based reintegration and rehabilitation. Um, and what lessons that we have drawn from this and then um, could be applied in other contexts. So to begin with, um, the situation in Nigeria is such that we, we even before COVID, we had a challenge with the um, release of children from armed forces um, of Nigeria um, in the absence of an instrument uh, formalizing this, this activity. So Nigeria doesn't have a handover protocol, um, even though we occasionally get um, children released from military detention. We think um, COVID has um, impacted it in a way that um, the numbers are no longer as we used to have. Nevertheless, with um, the Civilian Joint Task Force, which is more or less a, a civil militia working alongside Nigeria's security forces, we have continued to enjoy some very good progress despite COVID. Action plan signed for the release of children is still being implemented. Over 2,000 children were released before COVID and these children continue to enjoy some form of community-based reintegration. Another group of children um, that we took on some form of um, child protection response for was the Amaljiri children. These are children who had moved from other states and uh, um, more or less in Northeast Nigeria undergoing some Quranic studies. COVID made it um, crucial for us to ensure that these children are repatriated um, into their mother states and have them uh, reunified and, uh, with their families. I would like Chris at this point to touch a bit on center-based re rehabilitation, uh, both the challenges and um, the best practices. And then Irene will look at the community-based and then I'll take over. Chris, over to you. All right, thanks so much, um, Patrick, and thank you so much, everyone. The center based um, COVID-19 came with its own uh, uh, peculiar challenges for the way we do and program and implement in the, um, um, in the rehabilitation center for children released from administrative custody into the uh, transit center. And be specific for those challenges, the social activities and uh, the schedules of engagement were, were disrupted because uh, COVID came with a new way of life. And um, lots of these uh, social activities and schedules were planned before uh, COVID without anticipating that there would be such a pandemic. So we needed to go back to the drawing board to, to readjust. And also we had this uh, struggle with having uh, uh, with the perception of the people of, of COVID and uh, these people including both the children, the caregivers and uh, the service providers, we have a struggle around uh, reality and, and belief, people not uh, being quick to adhere to uh, the COVID-19 prevention and, and, and control measures such as the use of masks, uh, face masks, social distancing, regular washing of hands and I know that this also affected the social cohesion and activities in, in the rehabilitation uh, center. And also very, very importantly, um, the COVID brothers challenge of uh, which led to limited contact with uh, children in the rehabilitation center. Because also in the rehabilitation center, um, we, one of the responsibility was also to identify specific needs of these children. So that was not, uh, that was a little bit challenging because when uh, you're not expected to meet with these children 
and have uh, more one-on-one -on -one discussion interactions with them, it was, uh, it was difficult identifying the specific needs of the children. However, the challenges, uh, and there were also good practices because uh, we believe challenges also present opportunities for us to, to adjust and also try new ways of doing things. So looking at the, the, these challenges uh, and also anticipating the, the lockdown challenges and uh, that could uh, arise, there was a business, a business continuity plan was uh, developed and also thoroughly implemented and it was a success. Also, uh, given the fact that uh, because in, in Northeast Nigeria, we had this lockdown to flatten the curve of COVID-19. So family tracing was, um, uh, there, there were challenges with family tracing. However, um, discussions were made with relevant authorities and uh, stakeholders in the response to, to permit focused uh, um, um, FTR on uh, most vulnerable children and uh, we received green light to actually uh, um, um, carry those out. And um, also anticipating that uh, the, the lockdown also was going to affect the, the health um, workers, as well as also uh, in anticipation of possible outbreak, which uh, we didn't pray for actually, um, a health clinic um, um, and uh, an isolation center was set up within the premises of the 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 rehabilitation center and also an ambulance also and, and kept within that premises for very very for emergency cases that would need immediate uh, um, and referrals to uh, secondary facilities and also all stakeholders including children uh, and including the children as well as everyone having access to the rehabilitation center were given thorough orientation on uh, the prevention and control measures of COVID-19. Yeah, and, and also, uh, we also ensure that mechanisms were put in place to ensure daily risk uh, mitigation, daily risk communication with uh, approved uh, messages for prevention and control of uh, COVID-19 as uh, developed by uh, WHO in coordination with NCDC and the State Ministry of Health down here in Bono. And, and we also saw um, um, successes as over time, people began to comply with, uh, uh, with uh, the prevention and control measures. And, and lastly, every day, we also ensured that children were encouraged to stay positive and they were encouraged to remain motivated. And this, we all, all we did within was um, to get them during the risk communication was strictly in compliance with uh, uh, the measures established for prevention and control. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you, Chris. So um, I will go through over the next few slides on first the challenges uh, of uh, implementing community-based uh, reintegration amidst uh, COVID-19. And also we'll look at uh, how we have been able to adjust to fit the situation and the best practices as well. So one of the challenges that we have uh, faced is the heightened or exacerbated uh, psychological distress uh, on already vulnerable children. Uh, this was as reported by children themselves and also as reported by the staff and the caregivers and community in general. The other challenge is social reintegration activity. They have been highly affected uh, with the school closure and some of our activities, uh, social uh, reintegration activities involved uh, supporting children to go back to school. So this was not possible with the school closures and also with the physical distancing rule, uh, we've not been able to conduct uh, those activities as was uh, initially uh, planned. And then there were some uh, emerging needs that had to be put into consideration in budgeting uh, for them. For example, the PPEs, they were not initially something that could have been foreseen. So those were some of the challenges that we experienced. And then how we were able to adjust, we 
have reduced even up to now we have reduced the number of participants most of our activities involved bringing a lot of people together their social cohesion activities but for to, to ensure that we keep our beneficiaries as well as our staff safe we have reduced the number of uh, participants in any given activity and we have relied so much during this period on community-based uh, structures. We have the child protection, uh, community-based child protection committees, and we also have community-based uh, case workers. So we are relying on them to facilitate most of these activities. Also, like I mentioned, some of the activities for social cohesion were supposed to take place in schools. But now with the school closure, we had to have some uh, more dialogue with the children, the school patrons, to see how the activities uh, can still be conducted by the same children, but outside school. And we were able to, they were able to come up with uh, very uh, innovative ways of how they could conduct such activities. And uh, one of uh, such initiative was to uh, distribute masks to the to the community members as well as uh, giving door-to-door -door, uh, awareness messages uh, on COVID and peace building as well and then we modified some of the activities we had to modify completely like uh, community participatory theater this activity involved bringing a lot of people together and we had to adjust it uh, to modify it completely into a radio program. All right, yeah, Irene, thank you. Thank, right, thank, thank you so you. much, Irene. Just to flag the last two slides, like Irene mentioned, um, community-based structures have proven to be a very good um, stopgap measure, um, especially in this particular context where um, lockdowns and movement restrictions were the order of the day. So um, this is something that we, 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 we think um, should be used in this kind of situation um, because it has proven to be quite um, a, a positive strategy. We also used mobile phones and conferencing in the absence of um, physics and uh, proximity to each other. Um, although this one worked well in some context, um, in some activities like community dialogues where you need community to be together and openly discuss issues and come up with um, challenges and practical solutions, it, uh, it was a bit challenged in the sense that um, not all had access to mobile phones and um, most times those communities do not have a way of even charging those phones and so it wasn't the most effective um, strategy. The last is that um, this, this, these children in the community in the rehabilitation centers who had been trained on um, some basic skills, including tailoring, um, dressmaking, etc. Um, we are very useful in, in this particular situation as they were physically involved in um, producing face masks for themselves and the communities. And we also engage a range of community actors, um, opinion leaders, um, traditional leaders to also help in this particular context. Otherwise, thank you from Nigeria. Thanks, Irene, and thanks, Chris. Over to you. Thanks very much to, to you and thank you all um, the panellists uh, for your presentations and for keeping them as pretty good to, to time. We've now got about say about half an hour, um, 35 minutes for some questions. So um, this is a, a question I think to, to all countries, uh, to all, all panellists. You've highlighted a lot around sort of what you've been able to do, um, particularly through uh, community-based uh, interventions um, as regards to in reintegration programming um, and sort of what's worked, what's not worked quite so well. I wonder if you could uh, share a bit more about what you've been able to do and if you've been able to do anything um, on prevention of recruitment. I'll ask uh, Philippine co colleagues um, to respond first. Thank you, uh, Kristen, for the question. I, I think I'd start by saying that uh, in, in the Philippines, we have been doing uh, the prevention work and that something continues. And, and it's not that we have a stop and we'll continue. And, and the way we work, it's in the framework of peace building approach programming, uh, improving the social cohesion, strengthening the government system to improve access to services 
at all levels, especially in remote and, and uh, underserved uh, municipalities or areas. And another area that we are working with the communities and with adolescents and youth themselves, support to youth networks and providing, with the, uh, providing them with the tools and platforms uh, like you report to voice uh, uh, their concerns, to share their uh, uh, ideas and to have the chance to influence decision making uh, of the government. And this has been very useful in, uh, in coming up with the youth agenda that was recently uh, developed with support from uh, UNICEF and partners by Bangsamoro Youth Commission. Uh, another area that we engage with the communities include uh, partnership with the Muslim religious leaders to make uh, reliable uh, information available to parents as well as to adolescents and youth, uh, and then to continue to continue awareness raising uh, in the context of COVID through radio programs and uh, through uh, uh, Friday prayers where uh, still it's going on. So in brief, uh, we, we, we would like to improve uh, access to services, bring opportunities uh, for participation to adolescents and youth uh, to become agents of change for, for, their themselves, for themselves, for their communities, and also to make sure they have access to correct and uh, reliable information about the uh, correct narratives from Islam, from religious, and they feel belong, belonging to their communities and contribute positively in their lives. Thanks so very much, Reid. Um, colleagues from Nigeria, do you have anything to add to that in relation to the work you've been able to do on prevention? Yes. No, in Nigeria, of course, there are two main groups, Boko Haram, um, and the CJTF, which um, are being listed in the SG's report for recruitment and use. With Boko Haram, there's really very little that we have been able to do because we don't have access to them. But um, with the CJTF, we have um, had a review of the action plan signed, signed um, with them. Uh, we brought together all commanders and um, secretaries from the different LGAs in the three states of Northeast Nigeria. Um, getting them to recommit to respecting the zero tolerance for recruitment and use of children. Um, this actually happened some few weeks back, which was very positive, and um, it was like re-emerging, uh, and for them to uh, reaffirm their commitment for, for this. Um, and also with our community-based child protection networks, we have um, continued to carry out the same advocacy at the different LGAs where they're present. And so communities are also aware of um, of the, of the need not to encourage um, child recruitment. Um, what seems to be happening in the CGTF is that there is um, no conscious recruitment policy of children, but the occasional use of children for menial jobs. And this is what we're trying to, to tackle now. Like I said, initially, over 2000 children were already separated from their ranks. Um, and uh, the whole of last year, when we did not re register any fresh recruitment of children by them. However, the occasional use of children, and this is what we're trying to, to, to get them to understand that they mean more or less are the same thing, and, and, and there's no room for that. Over. Thanks very much. Um, and Vanessa and Richard, um, are there um, sort of practices experiences on um, prevention that you can share from South Sudan? Yeah, I think the only thing that I'll add is the importance of a multi-sectoral response. I mean, many times these children, whether they're forcibly recruited or they choose to join, it is because of a lack of resources um, in, in the household. And if we think across the ecology of the child, which if you know me, I think it's my favorite thing to speak about, there really is the importance of working with parents and caregivers as well as communities. So I met, very briefly, I met one boy and he spoke to, yes, he was released, but he also didn't want to go home because it was an unsafe and not a healthy home environment. So he was now living on his own, uh, you know, late teen living on his own, doesn't want to be home because that's what he felt was safest for him. And as much as we did try to have conversations with the parents as well as with the boy, there was no reconciling that. Um, so in order to prevent that, you need to think about how you can um, sustain the well-being and livelihood of this boy 
um, and then for other children who do return home for their households as well. Because um, again, in South Sudan, the socioeconomic um, impacts uh, overall because of the civil war and certainly now because of COVID and limitations, um, that's hugely important and cannot be discounted. So meeting overall household needs um, and working with children, their parents, peers, etc. That's a significant concern um, to prevent child recruitment. Thanks very much. Um, we have a question for the Philippines. Um, you gave some very good ways in which programming has been adapted uh, to COVID and, and what's been able to continue, and, and thanks very much for that. What challenges did you face um, originally? Um, and we've seen how you've been able to adapt your, your work, um, but were there challenges that you weren't able to, to address? Yes, the most challenges actually we, we experience um, during uh, this time of pandemic. Since we, we, we adjusted on the, on the program, uh, mostly internet connections. That's why we muchly um, depend uh, on our trained parasocial worker to reach out the children, to, to deliver the modules, uh, the tasks, in a weekly uh, basis manner. Um, at the same time, we were able to um, tap also our trained uh, captives or the religious uh, leader to help us, especially in the delivering of uh, child protection sermon. And at the same time, here in Mindanao especially, we believe that these uh, trained captives um, uh, are very influential in, in dealing with this, um, disengaged children and their families. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, we have a question from Bridget um, uh, for uh, South Sudan and Nigeria colleagues. What specific challenges uh, have you faced in relation to family tracing and reunification and how have you um, addressed these challenges? In the context of South Sudan, we have been able to address family tracing and reunification by working, uh, identifying partners who are present in the, the different locations from which the children come to be able to link up with the families of these children. Because in the context of uh, a suspension of, mo of, of restrictions on movement, it was difficult for uh, case workers to move from one area to another. So we opted to use partners who are present in different, in a certain location where the children come from to be able to uh, trace for the families of these children, and then they would link up, especially, I mean, given that uh, some of the children got stranded up in, in, in Juba, which is the capital. So uh, we managed to establish links, the families of these children using partners who are present on the ground from where these children are coming. They would do the tracing, and then of course the children would communicate with their families on phone waiting for, of course, the travel restrictions to be lifted, and then we can facilitate the movement of these children to their locations. Yeah, thank you. Thanks very much, Richard. Patrick or Irene or um, Chris, do you have anything to add to that from the Nigeria experience? I think it's pretty much the same, working with, um, with um, partners, especially local NGOs, and then showing that um, they help with this. And like, like the lockdown wasn't that long in, in, in Nigeria, which was also quite um, helpful um, because at the time we had quite a lot of children in our center, but it wasn't that long. And with the support of partners, we were also able to do that. Thanks very much. We have another question around whether we've seen an increase in recruitment um, during uh, COVID. Patrick and, and Irene and Chris, if I can come back to you first, is this something that you have have seen, I know that you've been working on, on monitoring reporting over the past sort of, uh, several months. Now, our last reports don't suggest so. I wouldn't be surprised if some of this was linked to inaccessibility uh, because of um, uh, increased insecurity, but also COVID. But um, our reports in the last two, three quarters did not, did not, suggest, did not suggest so. Thanks. Um, and with colleagues from, from the Philippines or South Sudan, have you noticed any increase in um, recruitment or again, perhaps because of, of access, it's not something that's been able to be picked up? 
Yeah, unfortunately, I haven't, uh, as you say, because of access, we haven't been able to mark an increase or decrease in recruitment. Thanks very much. We've, we've highlighted the, the guidance uh, note that was, was developed, the, the key recommendations and considerations for CAFE programming. Given the, the challenges that you've had and how you try to address these, um, are there sort of further gaps or existing gaps that haven't been sort of addressed in, in the guidance? And what further support or recommendations would you would you like to, to receive or do you feel are needed uh, by implementing agencies? Um, I'll come to the Philippines. You can answer that first. Yes, um, I think the guidance and um, the key considerations for CAFAG programming in the context of COVID-19 is um, very much useful and relevant, no? not only for UNICEF and it's for UNICEF, but also um, with other partners, no? um, especially if we have to make necessary adjustments in the reintegration program that we are currently implementing in the country. It's actually set guidelines and key priority actions that we could also apply to ensure that um, follow-up support for children and their families are continuous, including the, the access to social services. Further recommendation that we have, I guess um, it will be very helpful as well to include some of the case studies, no? set some examples from different countries, think that we have different contexts as well. No? If you can see, um, Philippines context is also different from Nigeria and South Sudan um, based on the background that um, shared by our speakers. And um, the way that we share this guidelines, so we're working closely with the, we have this um, joint child protection and gender-based violence working group at the sub-national level. And we're using this as a platform for sharing um, key messages, um, other adjustments and guidance and protocols. And we're including, there's a plan um, for the working group, especially that it is being co-chaired you know, by UNICEF and UNFPA for GBV um, to include um, discussion you know, on the uh, key messages and considerations of this CAFAG programming during COVID-19 as one of the learning sessions you know, that we will be conducted um, during its regular technical working group meetings. And I guess uh, we're receiving a lot of interest coming from members as well because during the onset of the COVID-19 in the Philippines, uh, we've been asking you know, from other colleagues um, including um, New York, if they have um, available um, guidance note that they, they could share, and um, so luckily that we found it as shared by the um, by the alliance. No, so thank you very much for that. Thank you. And colleagues from Nigeria, is there further guidance that you feel is um, would be useful uh, that you haven't been able to receive so far? I think I think um, you know even prior to co prior to COVID there was a challenge in donor funding and now it's already going down even further and so um, guidance are lo along um, how we do uh, very specific programming in this context I mean it's it's not the regular emergency we 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 used to this is completely new strange and we just need to find a way to adapt to it but if there are specific guidance on um, a programming within the context of COVID for this particular group of children, uh, it will be useful, useful for us in Nigeria. Yes, there has been uh, guidelines uh, produced by the child protection subsector, but also it has proved to be very important to have uh, guidelines for specific activities. For example, we have uh, guidelines for uh, MHPSS. So if we could have for specific components, uh, that would be great. Super, thank you very much. Colleagues from South Sudan, um, do you feel that there um, is the, the guidance that's already been developed and, and the work that you've been doing within the, um, the CAPAC working group in South Sudan, has it been sufficient or are there other um, issues that you 
would like more guidance on you feel that would be useful, particularly given some of the constraints that you've, you've highlighted? Of course, we, with the outbreak of COVID, the last TICAFAG uh, working group I attended, we had just disseminated those guidelines in the CAFAG working group. And then, of course, um, with the outbreak of COVID and restrictions of movement, it all affected the activities. So we really haven't had much time to operationalize these guidelines, but we found them very useful at the time of dissemination within the CAFAG working group. Thank you. And in a way, we have a, another question which can be seen as a bit of follow-up to that from, from Alexandra around um, how you've been able to adapt um, case management uh, services to children uh, within the con context of COVID and noting the restrictions that, that you um, have all highlighted. And in a way, sort of linked to that, how, how have you been able to guarantee um, access to basic services specifically for the, the set of, of children who have particular uh, particular situation. Let's so go back to colleagues in, from South Sudan um, to follow on what you just said. With regard to case management, of course, how we have been able to adapt uh, was to use case workers, community-based case workers, to provide case management. Of course, they were being supported by uh, the community structures, child protection mechanisms, to be able to identify of cases of vulnerable children and then they would be uh, they would be referred to the community based case workers to provide case management uh, technical support for the case workers was being provided by uh, their technical people using their phone to be able to guide them on what to do at community level so of course yeah case management continued being provided by community based case workers working with community structures and receiving support from their superiors uh, using the phone. Management continued while following the, the, the standard operating procedures. Yeah, I'll add just slightly from World Vision's perspective and speak very transparently that because of COVID and uh, reduction in funding overall and diversion of funding, we actually ended our program in June of 2020. We didn't see a renewal of some existing partnerships. Um, but all of that to say, what we, what we were doing um, as part of our program was also training um, government seconded social workers and case supervisors um, to support the program. It wasn't exclusively World Vision staff. We were trying to um, ensure sustainability of the actual uh, child protection system within, within South Sudan. Um, so we hope that those structures have continued. Um, and in addition to what Richard said, our work with the community-based child protection structures, um, their work to monitor child protection violations, um, that is ongoing. But again, when it comes to the the one-to-one, the -one, um, Richard has outlined what, what uh, organizations in South Sudan are doing with respect to one-to-one -one protective equipment, uh, phone calls, et cetera. Um, but the reality is that the advocacy point certainly is that in order to continue case management safely and respond to the needs of these children, um, we can't discount that there are multiple humanitarian crises in South Sudan. And so, yes, we're thinking about COVID, but we don't want to stop funding or divert activities um, because of this. This is still a life-saving response, and that's a key advocacy point as well, that many of these activities um, you know, case management, as an example, were asked to stop because they weren't seen as life-saving. Um, so we've made adjustments where possible and we're seeing alleviations in country and what we're able to continue. But unfortunately, some of these activities are the first to stop or the first to go when something like this happens, not understanding the repercussions. Uh, thanks very much. Um, just to pick up point and um, after this question I'd like to ask um, a colleague from Myanmar to, to also contribute uh, with their experiences but I just want to pick up a point that you you made around the fact that you know a number of, of you have commented that resources have, have been limited have been squeezed um, as funding from, from, from donors has been diverted and it's and affected all, all agencies whether an NGO or the UN agency etc. Um, I'm I'm interested in the uh, advocacy that you've done um, and the engagement that you've done with particularly authorities to ensure that um, services uh, and interventions can continue and there continues to be attention on specifically on 
on CAFAG. Um, colleagues from Nigeria, you, you mentioned that you'd had uh, some engagement with with the authorities, how were you able to engage with them and, and ensure that children were prioritised and, and the situation of these children um, was was demonstrated to be um, necessary to support? Thank you. Well, uh, our work with the Ministry of Women Affairs and Social Development, the, the Ministry in Charge of Children, has been a very strong. Uh, the relationship looks quite strong and they understand the need for sustainability and for them to take ownership. And so why should provide the technical support? They are, are more or less ready to, to, to carry out this work, understanding that, um, in fact, they, they honor stress primarily on them. But also, our work with the Ministry of Justice that is um, um, charged with the responsibility of working with the Civilian Joint Task Force on um, the non-recruitment and use of children, um, again, has been very, very strong. In Nigeria, civil society is also quite strong. Um, so for instance, uh, case management that we're talking about is more or less managed by um, um, national organizations, Gold Strong, Group Prime, uh, and a few others. And so um, this is all within the context of trying to get them to understand that there's a need for sustainability and the need for ownership. And that um, in the end, um, we might not have the funds to get all this going on, but then they should be able to to carry out this within their regular social um, work um, in the States. So this is what is more or less happening um, in Northeast Nigeria with um, government and local counterparts. Thanks very much. I'd like to, um, we've had a, a bit of a chat uh, with uh, colleagues in Myanmar who'd like to share some of their experiences. Yes, I'm sorry if I I've mispronounced your, your name. Um, if you can, I can give you just a couple of minutes if you would like to share um, the work that has been done in, in Myanmar and some of the challenges and, and that you've experienced and, and how you've tried to address them. Um, over to you. Yes, we oh, can hear thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I didn't expect it to, to have a chance to share the Myanmar yeah, experience. Uh, thank you so much. So in the COVID uh, situation, we've been facing uh, the several issue like uh, because of the, some cafe is already in the work and they already have a job, but when the business owner shut down their business and they return to their uh, community, in that moment, in that in that in that situation, uh, several children they facing like uh, community not accept them and also business owner not not willing to accept them because of there is not they are not able to operate, uh, you know uh, the. Uh, daily business things, so there's no more income for them, and they are also not able to go back home, and they're stuck in the middle of you know that situation. So, and uh, government also announced that not accepting any strangers, uh, uh, even to the monastic, uh, the uh, the religious building. So the religious leaders are also not willing or not able to accept them. So they have to stay on the streets, and uh, and then at the time. There's a curfew, government announced a curfew and you know that they are really in the, the, the very dangerous situation. So if they, they are found on the street uh, within the curfew periods, they will be arrested. So in these cases, a lot of, a lot of things we are facing and uh, we struggle to ad address. So at the last, uh, uh, if I'm going to uh, make sure, uh, shorter of my reflection, uh, we engage with the business owner again, and we negotiate, convince them, and then also we try to support the some uh, the like uh, daily meals during this period, and also we communicate to their uh, community leaders, and also uh, how to say that uh, until the government uh, lifted the uh, all the lockdown. Uh, the situation. So uh, after two or three months, the government released, you know, like uh, all the restrictions, and then we arrange immediately uh, something like to to go back to be able to go back to their communities immediately. So that kind of situation. This is one of the uh, one of the scenario among the uh, a lot of other issues. So, however, like the uh, someone from the student said. This is an unexpected situation. We've never been 
uh, experience like that before. So we have to adapt based on that, uh, you know, case by case issue. And also, yeah, just, I just want to share this one, but uh, there's a lot of other issue as well. But uh, the, uh, if I may, just one point regarding the access to the non-state actor, because of some several children are also released from the armed groups, but they are listed as a illegal association by, by the government of the Myanmar. So when they, are, uh, when they release the children, we cannot go and pick up, you know, cannot do the family trees, family reunification. So this is also another challenge. So we're trying to, you know, convince that, uh, that armed groups and also the uh, CSO, CBO based in that uh, NGC area, although they are not trained, but however, they are aware of the child protection. So we deal with them and then uh, to support, to assist that kind of family reunification in this very, very challenging situation. So thank you so much and over. Thank you so much for that additional uh, contribution. Um, it's very welcome to receive. Um, we're almost at time and I have one more question that um, I, we'd like to, to pose um, and then a few sort of announcements um, before we finish. Vanessa, you had mentioned sort of the importance of, of advocacy um, and a number of other of you have talked about the importance of, of advocacy to ensure that the work that was previously ongoing um, in relation to the release uh, and reintegration of, of children prevention of recruitment is able to continue and uh, the impact of COVID has highlighted other um, points uh, for advocacy. Um, I wonder whether, um, in addition to the points that have been made, whether you have sort of one or two other advocacy messages or recommendations that you would like to make. Um, and colleagues in the Philippines, if I can come to you first. Uh, yeah, thanks, thanks, uh, Tristan. As uh, mentioned already, uh, that in the context of COVID-19, uh, the already under-resourced uh, child protection services uh, affected also negatively because uh, the resources have been diverted to uh, COVID and the uh, child protection services uh, are, are not considered that essential in this context. So the two key advocacy points that we'd like to uh, highlight here is that to ensure continuity of the essential child protection services including during the containment measures uh, that to make sure the services are there for children and they're part of life-saving uh, services. The second is to ensure that government will invest sufficient resources to strengthen, the, uh, strengthen and expand the social services workforce as well as the provision of child protection services uh, with a strong focus on prevention side to make sure children are protected and prevented from uh, association and reassociation uh, with the armed groups. Thank you. Great, thanks very much. And colleagues from Nigeria, uh, Patrick, Irene, Chris, um, what two advocacy recommendations in addition to those that have already been mentioned uh, would you like to um, add? <clears throat> I think in, in addition to what Farid is, is, is mentioned, we, we just want advocacy around um, the fact that government should not take their eyes off the ball in terms of what children are going through and that COVID is further exacerbating the already vulnerable state in which they are. You know, and uh, all resources should be marshaled and um, the ministries in charge of social welfare and social development must be strengthened, uh, both uh, in terms of human and financial resources. Um, at the state and the federal level, as donor funds continue to, to, to dwindle, that state should be able to generate their own um, and also ensure that budget allocations for these very specific ministries uh, are considered. Yeah, I think um, down here we, we've um, tried to see how we encourage the government to, to take the lead and um, also like Patrick mentioned earlier, the, the in, we prioritize in implementing through the Ministry of uh, Women Affairs and Social Development because um, uh, and the Ministry of Women Affairs and Social Development also playing an instrumental, a very key part in the Borno State uh, uh, Task Force for COVID-19. So uh, 
while we give them the opportunity is that uh, is for them to also ensure that they they advocate within that that circle that uh, every response and programming for for in response to COVID-19 in the states captures the, the needs of, of the children. And the, the commissioner for the Ministry of Women Affairs and Social Development has also been very, very vocal through, through support from UNICEF to also ensure that uh, uh, the children are not left out in, in the programming for, for CAFAC down here in, uh, in Nigeria. So we'll, we'll continue to do that. We'll continue to ensure that they take the lead and uh, also we'll continue to remain available to provide them with technical support. Because uh, like Patrick also said, tomorrow when we're not here, it is uh, the honest falls on the table to carry on from where we have stopped. And then that is why we remain committed to ensuring that uh, they do, they, they, their capacity is built around that. And so that we can be very, very uh, uh, confident to say that uh, children in this context are safe when we're not here. Thank you so much. Um, we're at time now. Um, so I'd just like to make a, a couple of uh, announcements and comments before we close. Um, a couple of colleagues have asked where we can get further information, um, both on um, sort of CAFAC responses for, for COVID, but also um, other guidance as, as well. If I can um, share my screen to the Alliance website. So, um, there's further guidance available um, on COVID um, and adaption of, of interventions um, on the Alliance website. There is a Q&A um, box um, on the website as well. At the bottom there, it's called Hannah. Um, there are a couple of questions that unfortunately we haven't been able to, to um, answer. Uh, we've run out of time and I do apologise for that um, but we will be using that Q&A facility on the Alliance website to respond to that. Um, I'd also like to um, highlight the establishment of a new CAFAG task force um, within the Alliance. Um, let me see if I can just bring this up for you. The, the web page for that is now available, so please look at that web page um, for further information. It's a task force that has, is being uh, co-led by uh, Plan International and UNICEF. Whoops, sorry, I've just pressed the wrong one. Um, so, but there is more information um, on that uh, task force on the Alliance website. Um, the last announcement that I also wanted to, to highlight um, was a paper that has been developed, um, written by Plan International on girls who've been uh, recruited and used by armed forces and armed groups. Um, and that is available from Plan International colleagues. Um, and we can um, put a reference to that on the Catholic Task Force um, website as well. Um, here's the website here, sorry to open the wrong page up earlier. Um, so uh, we're at time now. Uh, I would like to thank very much all the, the present presenters um, from Nigeria, from South Sudan, from the Philippines, um, for all the work you've done in preparing the presentations and, and giving, uh, giving us um, the information you have. I appreciate very much for Fareed and, and, um, and other colleagues from the Philippines that it is very late there. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, to do this at the end of your working day. There will be a, um, a recording of the webinar uh, shared through um, by the Alliance um, shortly. But following all of this, I'd like to, to thank everybody um, for calling and participating. I hope you have found it informative and useful. Thank you very much. <music>